Welcome to the Barrens to Bald Eagle Wildlife Corridor. My name is Colleen DeLong and I'm the habitat biologist at Clearwater Conservancy. The corridor is actually made up of two properties, one that Clearwater owns that's about 40 acres, open to the public with a nice trail through it. Please come and enjoy it after you watch the video and get a little tour. And then the other half of the corridor is made up of our neighboring farm who are our partners in the corridor and it's a nice lightly grazed farm and it connects the bald, the bald eagle ridge connects to state game lands 176 which is also known as the scotia barrens which is a nice amazingly rare habitat in the middle of uh, center county where we live and um, the corridor is about 100 acres and we have a trail on our side which dan true is here with me filming thank you dan and we're going to take a walk and show you all the different habitat management practices we're doing out here. So this property used to be um, farm fields and, and part of it was hay. So on this section, we just let the hay go and we let it grow into a grassland habitat. And so you can actually see some of the Timothy and orchard grass and brome grass going to seed. So those are the old hay grasses. And this creates a good nesting cover for grassland birds like red-winged blackbirds and savanna sparrows, uh, meadowlarks. We've seen a, a lot of uh, nice grassland birds out here using this part of the habitat. And, and um, so you can choose a lot of ways to turn something into a natural meadow and one of them is to just let something grow like let part of your lawn grow, let your hay field grow and eventually native wildflowers will show up. So we have right now we have a lot of goldenrod coming in which is a great pollinator habitat and um, milkweed are coming in, daisy fleabanes show up, we have some asters coming in later in the season. And so it becomes more diverse for the, for the habitat value. And you, we just manage it by mowing a different section every couple years because we want to be careful not to let it turn back into forest. And if you let an old field go long enough, 
you'll start to get woody species moving in because that's normal in Pennsylvania. That's what most of our land wants to go back to is becoming forest because we are Penn's woods. So we mow a section of it every once in a while. And we, don't, we never mow it all at once because we don't want to remove all the cover for the wildlife. So we just mow it in sections each year. And we're about to mow another section um, now. August and se early September are good times to mow. We don't like mowing during the nesting season, which is about roughly April to August. So we stay out and don't disturb any of our nesting birds that we're trying to provide habitat for. And then we'll mow it in August or September. That'll give it a little bit of time to grow back before winter. So we have nice cover for the winter and holding the soil in place. And um, the other thing we do for management, which we have to do in any kind of habitat management is control the invasive species that show up. Walk along the trail from the parking lot we first go through the grassland and then when you get to the top of the hill we actually have a two and a half acre um, swath of land where we intentionally seeded a wildflower mix to benefit the pollinators and so we're standing in that right now so this is our pollinator habitat and we will actually mow sections of this to maintain it too there are also some native grasses mixed in here and again some invasive species moving in we have some um, multiflora rose I see behind Dan and some Bradford pears which are incredibly invasive in natural areas and we're also getting some ornamental grasses moving in here so we have to work on keeping those out every year. trail from the wildflower meadow into the area where we planted a whole lot of trees and shrubs to provide reforestation and habitat for a variety of species. This is a big shrub section that we're standing in right, right here and one of the key species that we planted a lot of are the dogwood shrubs. Most of you are probably familiar with the flowering dogwood which is a small tree that we plant in our backyards but it's also a native forest understory plant in the eastern deciduous forest. These shrubs are cousins to that 
to that beautiful tree. And they get great flowers that attract pollinators. And then they provide incredible numbers of berries on their little panicles. And this one is just starting to set fruit. And um, the birds actually prefer these dogwood fruits um, so much that as soon as they're ripe, they're gone and they use them up. And so they don't actually um, last through the winter. And then we have other species like viburnums in here whose fruits are not as highly preferred, but they become very important later on in the fall and winter when the birds eat up all the dogwood and, and their other preferred fruits, and then they switch to those. So vernal pools are very important for amphibians, partly because they're, the water source is seasonal. They fill up it with spring rains and snow melts, and then the um, amphibians come and reproduce, lay their eggs. You've probably seen lots of clumps of frog eggs in, in different types of puddles and pools yourself while you're hiking. And the key thing is that because it's a temporary water source, a seasonal water source, it doesn't support fish, which would eat all the eggs of the amphibians and probably some amphibians themselves. So that's um, the importance of vernal pools. And we try to take care of them. There's throughout the barrens and this, uh, the Scotia Barrens habitat, there's um, many, many vernal pools and they are um, well taken care of by both the game commission and others who own parts of that land. So one of the things we're doing within our bigger wildlife corridor property is we're actually building more of a corridor, a forested corridor to the Scotia Barrens forest behind us to this vernal pool so that they're better connected by overhead um, canopy and produce a lot of shade for the amphibians because amphibians, as you know, have semi-permeable skin and they can easily dry out when they're traveling through uh, warm environments like an open field or a mowed lawn. So they're doing okay here and they do they do migrate to this pool each year because we don't mow our understory uh, where we have all our reforestation projects going on. We actually let the, the native plants and the grasses um, grow really thickly. So they're surviving, but we're gonna make that habitat better for them. And we'll have a small amphibian corridor within our bigger wildlife corridor.
Okay, so I'm standing in a nice patch of goldenrod. Um, that's one of the uh, first native plants that comes in to fill in an understory in a in an area where you're not mowing. And it's a great, there's many species, there's at least six species of goldenrod native to Pennsylvania, and I think more than 30 in the Northeast um, US. And they are fantastic late season pollinator plants, and they are not um, allergy causing like some people think. It, the reason why we think of goldenrod as causing allergies is because the ragweed blooms at the same time of the year, but the goldenrod have these beautiful showy yellow flowers and we see them and so we think, oh, that must be the culprit of our allergies when the, the ragweed, which have these tiny little green flowers that nobody even notices, they're the ones that actually have wind dispersed pollen. They have very light pollen, so it blows in the wind, gets in our noses and gives us allergies. The goldenrod pollen is actually really heavy, doesn't get in the wind and just mostly just drops to the ground. So this is the part in the hike where I usually say, does anybody know the story about monarch butterflies and milkweed plants? And years ago when I asked that, lots of people would, nobody would raise their hand, but lately a lot of people raise their hand because people are becoming way more aware of some of these um, very important conservation issues. And so here's a milkweed. This is a common milkweed and it's, um, it's already past flowering and, and setting seed and the pods are um, full of seeds and very easy to collect seeds to grow your own. So the, the butterflies are very tied to this plant ecologically. They lay their eggs on it. They're, they're, they have to lay their eggs on it because the, um, the caterpillars that then hatch out eat this plant. They're one of the only species that can actually successfully eat this plant because it's got some sort of, some level of poisonous chemicals in it. Um, and, and a lot of animals don't eat the plant, although a few deer have browsed a few of mine at my house, I've noticed, but they haven't eaten the whole plant. So maybe they decided it wasn't any good to eat. And um, so the caterpillars eat the plant and they take on a chemical that makes them poisonous to predators. And then when the caterpillar turns into the butterfly, the butterfly, that, that um, chemical protection is transferred to the butterfly and the butterflies are actually poisonous to uh, predators and it protects them and helps them to survive. moving around the, to the end of the tree planting on the trail and we're in the evergreen cover and hardwood tree section. So we have uh, mostly white pines planted for evergreen cover and these guys are really, uh, most of the initial trees that were planted on this site are only nine years old 
And so we've had tremendous growth on some of them. It's, it's actually wonderful. And then the hardwoods in this section are oaks, hickories, and tulip trees. Um, so that you can see how well the evergreen cover is, is working right now. And the best thing about evergreens, and I know that a lot of in landscapes, we tend to like to take the lower branches off so we can walk under our evergreens, but those are the most critical branches for wildlife cover. And so when evergreens are young and they have lots of lower branches, this is phenomenal cover, especially in, in deep snows. This is where animals like grouse and rabbits will survive during deep snow periods. And not that we get a lot of deep snow, but if once in a while we do. And um, so this is great winter thermal cover to keep um, wildlife healthy and alive in the wintertime.